Father, we come before you, Lord. We thank you for your goodness to us. We know clearly the heavens declare the glory of God in so many ways, whether it's solar eclipses or northern lights, uh, so many ways you show us your your grandeur and your design and uh, your wisdom, Father, your power, your omnipotence, your sovereignty. We thank you, Lord, for that display in creation. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for special revelation, the word of God, which you revealed so that we can understand clearly. And as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can grow in your grace. We thank you for the privilege, Lord, and the opportunity that we have to take in your truth. So I pray that we might receive the word of God with humility, that our thoughts might be placed beneath your word, and may, may your word critique the thoughts and intents of the heart. Sanctify the believers here through your truth, because your word is true. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 6. John, chapter 6. I'm going to summarize geographically uh, where we are in this chapter. Uh, we dealt with the feeding of the 5,000, that account, a couple weeks ago. And here is a map of the Sea of Galilee and the nation of Israel. And so the feeding of the 5,000 occurred approximately in that location. And so north being up and south being down, you have east and west. So that would be literally on the northeastern side of the Sea of Galilee. Tradition, by the way, places it somewhere in this area uh, in the north uh, northwest portion of the Galilee. But I think better evidence, and I read some things about this, uh, the better evidence, I think, is the feeding of the 5,000 occurred on that side of the Sea of Galilee, approximately in this area. If you look on the, land, uh, on the um, Google Earth, there is a seaport approximately there you have to go partway down on the northeastern shore of the Sea of Galilee until you reach a place where a boat can launch. And so you have literally a launching place or a beach there where I think the disciples launched out on their journey uh, before Jesus walked on the water. So you have the account of the feeding of the 5,000. Now, so if you look at John chapter 6, this would occur here. Uh, in this first section of the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 1, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is called the Sea of Tiberias, and there was a great multitude followed him. And when they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased, and Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now, where is that located? Where was he with his disciples? There's an area not far from the location of the feeding of 5,000 where Jesus eventually, after the feeding of the 5,000, went to pray. He describes this here as a mount uh, in verse 3. But if you jump down in John chapter uh, 6, after the feeding of the 5,000, later on in this chapter, he says he went to that mount. And other gospel writers indicate that he went there to pray. So Jesus went to pray approximately in that location because that side of the Sea of Galilee uh, is there's a the hilly region there on the other side of the Sea of Galilee you can see a little bit of elevation in this mount, map but uh, Jesus went up in that that hilly spot to pray I think I actually have a picture a uh, modern day picture of this area hopefully I put this in the order in the slides um, Next, we have the launching of the boat, and his disciples went out to cross to the other side, headed toward Capernaum and eventually Gennesaret over here on this side of the Sea of Galilee. So they're headed in this direction. The winds, prevailing winds, by the way, is normally from the west. So the Mediterranean Sea had the prevailing winds that came normally from the west, so they're headed over in that direction. They're headed toward the seaport, Capernaum, and then eventually Gennesaret, on that side of the Sea of Galilee. And at this point, they row, and they're half the night rowing, and they're rowing several miles here, and they hit a storm. And so we see this storm here uh, later on in this chapter. Let's take a look in our Bibles here um, in chapter 6 and jump down a few verses to verse 15. Let's look at Matthew, excuse me, John 6, 16. Now when evening was come, his disciples went down to the sea, 
and got into a boat. So approximately where that X is, that's where the beach was. They launched off in the Sea of Galilee in a boat and went over the sea toward Capernaum. Capernaum is on the other side. Initially, that was their uh, first destination. And it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. And when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. So we have the account here, and other gospel writers add the account of Peter walking on the water. We're going to look at Peter walking on the water in Matthew's gospel. John leaves that account out, but it's the same event. Uh, so we have here Jesus walking on the water in, the middle, in mi the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, and they're facing a storm, and they're not making any headway. Jesus appears to to the disciples. And eventually they end up at Gennesaret, which is where that X is. And this is a miracle in and of itself uh, after Jesus got into the boat. And then notice here, they arrived to their destination on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Um, notice in verse 21, then they willingly received him into the boat and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going, transported immediately to their destination, arriving at Gennesaret uh, in the, at the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Now there's some tradi traditional things here following the event of the walking on the water. Um, and verse 22 and 23, when we get to that passage, gonna add some other things on this map, but notice verse 22, on the following day, when the people were standing on the other side of the sea, they saw there was no boat there except that the one which the disciple had entered and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias. Now, Tiberias would be this area down here. So if you're watching online, it'll be down here on this side. So apparently they went over to try to find Jesus over here and he wasn't there, and the boat was gone, so what's going on here? Uh, eventually, though, uh, they locate Jesus, and um, Jesus was where? Jesus was at Capernaum. He was in the synagogue teaching. So eventually, they found him in verse 24. When the people saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they got into boats and came to Capernaum. So they crossed back over. They couldn't find Jesus where he was, the feeding of 5,000. And therefore they crossed back over and eventually they found Jesus up here. And this was generally his home base where he performed many signs and miracles. And he was teaching there in the synagogue. We know that because the last verse in John chapter six tells us, uh, I think in John, no, John six fifty nine. Not the last verse, but in John 6, 59. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. So we have what is called the bread of life discourse. So the next event would be the bread of life discourse at the Capernaum synagogue. So this chapter uh, ends up with Jesus teaching here in the region of Capernaum at the synagogue. And of course, Jesus in this follows on the heel of him feeding 5,000, the crowd was looking for a handout. <laughs> they were looking for physical bread. And uh, they, Jesus said, though, I am the bread from heaven. And I have not only give physical substance, but I give eternal life. And you need to believe in me. And they didn't want that. They rejected that message. Uh, they want to see Jesus simply as a social provider instead of a savior. And there's some lessons there. But this is the account here of uh, John chapter 6. Now, we left off at verse 19 uh, with the disciples in frustration rowing against the prevailing wind in a storm for several hours. And they rowed about three or four miles. So they're approximately in the middle of the lake, uh, headed toward the other side, and they're not making any headway. 
they saw finally Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. Now, while he was praying, his disciples were rowing against a storm that battered the boat, as described in verse 24, and allowed them only three or four miles progress in about six to ten hours. Keep in mind, he was there during the third watch or near the end of the uh, night watch, and therefore we have about approximately 3 to 6 a.m. Uh, Jesus came and was walking on the water. So they were there already through the night uh, trying to get across, and then a storm prevented them from making any progress. So this writer says about 6 to 10 hours they're trying to make headway against that storm. Um, another writer says this, Jesus sent the disciples away and dismissed the crowds before it got dark, perhaps by 7 or 8 at night. And Jesus prayed from that hour until he came to his disciples during the fourth watch of the night. Think about that. He was up on that hill praying all during that time while his disciples were fighting the storm. Early in the, their history, the Jews had divided the night into three watches. At this point, however, they were following the Roman system, which included four watches and assigned to the fourth the hours between 3 and 6 a.m., this suggests that Jesus has been praying for six or seven hours and that the disciples have been rowing for the same length of time. Crossing the lake would not normally have taken that long, but a storm had come up suddenly and the boat was being buffeted by the waves and wind. Now, Matthew 24, let Matthew 14, 24, let's turn over to Matthew's gospel. Keep your place in John. And it's helpful if you have a harmony of the gospels um, that shows you these accounts in parallel. And uh, I have one actually that blends all four gospel accounts together, which is very helpful. And uh, Matthew 14, 24, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, toward, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. So Matthew adds this little detail. Uh, the boat was approximately in the middle of the sea. So they're not even close to the shoreline at this point. And that's very important because when John indicates that they immediately arrived at the shore, that's probably transported here several miles over to the other side immediately. So Matthew says they were in the middle of the sea. Now, think about why the disciples were, do, were there. Uh, storm rose, you know, why would God allow this in their life? Uh, I think it allowed it to see the power of God and the great miracle that Jesus would perform. But it's many times God's will to put us as believers in difficult situations, in the storms of life. Uh, we are in tests. We are tested as born-again believers. Now we know that James 1 indicates that the testing of our faith produces endurance. And God has a purpose for these various trials that he sends us, whether it's financial, whether it's health-wise, whatever the test is. Uh, God puts us in those difficult situations to mature our faith so that we will trust in him, so that we will actually see more of Christ as revealed in the word of God, and we will have greater confidence in him. So the disciples were in the same situation, but God placed them in a perfect place to see uh, the provision of the Savior. It's important to note that Christ saw his disciples in their struggle. Uh, let's take a look at Mark's account. Mark chapter 6, <coughs> verse 48. Mark 6, 48. Then he saw them straining at rowing. Think about that. That little phrase there. He saw them straining. <laughs> that will preach. God sees you struggling. God sees you, you know in panic mode. <laughs> God sees you in whatever situation you are. He knows that. He's aware of that. So God is obviously, as a born-again believer, realized that he knows where his children are. Ever think about that? Our Father knows exactly where we are and what we are struggling with. He knows our every need. And so it's not that God is unaware of our needs, but we need to trust him. So Mark 6, 48 then says, He saw them straining at the rowing, for the wind was against them. And he says this was the fourth part, 
fourth watch of the night. Now, they, on the other hand, they were afraid. Now, Mark 14, or Matthew 14, 26, Matthew's gospel, as that they saw, they thought they saw a spirit or phantom. And uh, Matthew 14, verse 26, and the disciples saw him walking on the sea. They were troubled, saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. They cried out for fear. Now, I don't think they had really correct theology at this point. Um, the souls of an unsaved person or souls of individuals 